Hello, my name is Ross Marshall, and I'm here discussing uh, universal reconciliation of all mankind. I'm reading from uh, some papers and commentaries I wrote on the subject, rather than talking off the top of my head. Uh, I'll be reading so I can be clear, cut, and concise, and uh, I'll interject some things along the way. But uh, we're finishing uh, going through uh, God's will. What is God's will <coughs> versus man's will? So we're picking up with what we left off. Praying is reaffirming God's will. First Timothy 2.1 uh, says, quote, I exhort, therefore, that, first of all, supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving thanks be made for all men. Would God inspire the hearts of his saints to pray for the salvation of all mankind if he knew they would not all be saved? Now, this is a standalone verse. A lot of people will say, well, read the context before and after, but and they'll make some uh, differentiations and reduce it down to a limited amount of people. But it says, all men. <clears throat> Remember that little word, all. Next we have, God has a fixed will. In Hebrews 10, 9, Jesus came to do the will of God. He says, Lo, I am arriving to do thy will, O God. He is dispatching the first, that he should be establishing the second. John 4.34 My food job is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Now, what is the will of God? The will of God is that all men are to be saved. This is his will, by way of distinction and preeminence. Jesus came to do this will. He came as the Savior of all men. He came as the Good Shepherd to seek and save that which was lost. He came to save all men, not only those who live on the earth while he was here, but all who lived before and all who have since lived, and all who shall ever live. The meaning of, quote, the Father is willing. Luke 11.2 and 1 Timothy 2.4 speak this. Yes. Our Father, which thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Uh, second, is, second is, who will have all men be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's the A.D. Does <clears throat> the Father is willing mean that God is wishing for things to happen or that he decrees and determines things to be in regards to humankind? What does the biblical expression, the Father is willing, mean? Does it mean God has a wish, desire, or hope of some sort for people, as many teach? Alternately, does it mean that God is determining, decreeing, and establishing a plan? Strong's defines the idea as determined. It's G2309. With the understanding of someone making a choice, doing it and cannot be stopped. In God's case, what he wills, he does, and what he does, he finishes. For, quote, the gifts and the calling, will of God, are irrevocable. That's Romans 11.29. We see below for a full list of the different usages of the root philo, T H E L O in Greek. Will. Let us read two important verses using the word will and see what God says about the universal reconciliation and ultimate salvation of all human beings. Now, what I've done here in the paper is uh, I put the Greek and I've dropped it down and put 
the exact English equivalent transliteration. Now, I do a literal translation. It's hard to read, but it's it's exactly uh, fixed according to the proper English uh, words meanings. <coughs> I can't read the Greek. Uh, it's a uh, pater meaning father. Hemon genetheto to thelima so hosen orano kea epa. <laughs> you Greek people out there don't laugh. But what I've got is, Father of us, let it be being become the will of you as in heaven and on the land. The literal translation would be, Father of us, let it be done, become the will of you as in heaven and on the land. Pretty close. The English syntax would be, our Father, let the will decree of yours be being done in heaven and also on the earth. Couldn't get any more clear than that. Uh, Thelema, Thelema and Strong's G2307. Thelema, Thelema, from the prolonged form G2309. A determination properly of the thing, actively, choice, especially purpose, decree, abstractly, volition, or passively, inclination. <clears throat> in addition, what exactly is God's will in heaven to be done also on earth? What is it exactly? 1 Timothy 2, 4. Whose wills, <clears throat> who wills that all mankind be saved and come into the realization of the truth. Concordant literal version translation. This is God's will in heaven to have all men be saved. Where else would God be willing other than his heaven? On earth. Even though it may not appear so to our eyes, our senses, or to our reasoning abilities, we must by faith transpose his heavenly will here and accept that his will is being done on this earth as it is willed in heaven. Modern theology notwithstanding. In the, uh, the Greek, it's who is willing all anthropos to be saved and into realization of truth to be coming. The English syntax is who is willing all humans to be saved and to be becoming into realization of this truth. What truth? willing all humans to be saved. Can't be any more clear than that. The word Thalia, Strong's G2309. The word Thelo, Thel, or, or Thelo, and in certain tenses, Thelio means to determine as an active option from subjective impulse. Whereas Strong's G1014, Bolomia, Bolomia, properly denotes rather a passive acquiescence in objective considerations, i.e., that is, choose or prefer, literally or figuratively, by implication, to wish, be inclined to, sometimes adverbially gladly, to be willing or to be willing to accept, impersonally for the future tense, to be about to in Hebrew, to delight in. God's will to be being become or done on earth is said here to be the same as that will he has in heaven. The Greek words used in these two passages are philema, to de a determination or a decree and philia, to determine. They both derive from the same Greek concept of making a fixed and unchanging decree these two passages point out that God's will in heaven is the same one that he has for man on earth, which is to determine or decree or set the determination to be done that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Can't be any more clear than that. Next we have God is reconciling all of us <coughs> in Romans 5.8. 
Now, what is this truth except that all, Greek, pantas, panta, or panton, that all men are decreed to be saved, and that he is going to reconcile all humankind to himself, so that he shall be all in all. Is this just the wish of God that all men should be, but will not be, possibly saved, as Orthodox Christianity states in their creeds and theolo theologies? Or is it God's will, determination that all humankind is to be saved? The clerics' creeds would have us believe that it is a passive wish and that not all will be saved, but most will be eternally damned, with few being redeemed. The truth is that damnation, judgment or wrath, is aeonian, or age-lasting, or lasting for the ages only, and not eternal. And all men will be saved. This is because God is reconciling all of us, and of course, humans, even as we are still yet sinners, unbelieving. That's what Paul said in Romans 5, 8. Today, many deny the Lord's Prayer that the Father is of our, or all mankind's, and that it is His will that all the anthropos, all humans, all mankind, are to be, become saved, and that all of us are decreed to come to the knowledge, knowing this glad tiding towards all men, of the truth that salvation is ultimately and effectively applied to all. Luke 2.10 And the angel said unto them, Fear not, limited atonement, Fear not, for behold, I bring you glad tidings, an evangel of great joy, which shall be for all people. Luke 2.10 it shall be for all people, whether alive or passed on. You don't cut them off at the grave. We'll talk about that later. Here are lists of uncountable. It's like 20 different versions of the word will, willing. Uh, they are willing. They may be willing is, is uh, uh, reference to humans. It shall be we are willing, etc., uh, etc., so, it, it's pretty clear a choice made, a decree. Will God save all mankind? Most people don't think so. They might hope that that's not true. Well, we can prove that it is. Is the glad tidings of great joy for all humankind, or only some? Is God's restitution of all, or for some of his creation? What is his will in this matter? How many have been the debates on this theme? The lines are clearly drawn. We believe the blessed hope of the restitution of all is the key to unite the Christian world and authenticate Christ's servants as divine messengers of the good news to a hurting world. The glad tidings of the restitution of all creation exalts, honors, and glorifies God's holy and loving character before the world. We cannot accuse God of being cruel, unloving, and unjust anymore. He is fair to all humans in all nations and throughout all ages. Acts 10, 34, 36. We are told not to judge the unbelieving, the heathen, the sinner, the savage. For all are already judged. John 3, 18. Furthermore, we are clearly told in the Bible that Christ came to not judge the world, but to save it. John John 12:47 to reprove it John 16:8 and to take away the sin singular of the world John 1:29 and to put away sin by his sacrifice Hebrew 9:26 and save it not to destroy human lives Luke 9:56 but to draw all men unto himself and redeem them John 12, 32, and to save that which was lost, Matthew 18, 11, and reconcile all things created in heaven and on earth, Colossians 1, 20, so that he may be all in all, 1 Corinthians 15, 28, to save that which was lost. Now, what, what human can you dig up or find on earth that is not lost? 
don't accept a believer. Some of them may be. He, to save that which was lost. He doesn't clarify whether uh, it's elect or uh, choosing not to or what. He came to save that which was lost. Right? This truth will transform Christian missions. It will elevate Christ to his rightful place as Savior of the whole cosmos, John 4, 42, and through him, as such, bring good news of great joy to every created being, Luke 2, 10. Now, moreover, this is the good news. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the cosmos, in three, singular, John 1, 29, who did not come to judge the cosmos, but to save the cosmos, John 12, 48, and to accomplish his work his Father sent him to do, John 17, 4. In addition, his work was to destroy and correct the devil's work, 1 John 3, 8. Many will question the scope and extent of Christ's great atoning work for all men, but he promised to save all men. Did he succeed? Absolutely, for we see futuristically that, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, his Father. Philemon 2, 9 through 11. For he is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, believers, but also for the sins of the whole cosmos. That includes everybody else. 1 John 2, 2. This is the definition of propitiation, as a noun, the action of propitiating or appeasing a god, spirit, or person, atonement, especially that of Christ. Some synonyms are appeasement, conciliation, and reconciliation. Thus we may say, quote, he is the appeasement and conciliation and, rec and reconciliation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole cosmos. To fully understand this verse without any doubts is to as to the true meaning, we can read it as such. Jesus the Anointed is the appeasement, conciliation, and rest reconciliation for our, the believers' sins, and not only for ours, believers, and apostles and disciples, etc., only, but Jesus the Anointed is the appeasement, conciliation, and reconciliation also, especially so, for the sins of the whole cosmos. The word propitiation carries the basic idea of appeasement and satisfaction, specifically towards God. Propitiation is a two-part act that involves appeasing the wrath of an offending person and being reconciled to him. The necessity of appeasing God is something many religions have in common. In ancient pagan religions, as well as many religions today, the idea is taught that man appeases God by offering various gifts or sacrifices. However, the Bible teaches uniquely that God himself has provided the only means through which his wrath is appeased and sinful man is reconciled to him as a whole. In the New Testament, the act of propitiation always refers to the work of God and not the sacrifices or gifts, works, human efforts, contingent acts of acceptance offered by man. The reason for this is that man is totally incapable of satisfying God's justice. There is no service, sacrifice, or gift that man can offer that will appease the holy wrath of God or satisfy his perfect justice, especially in this dispensation. The only satisfaction or propitiation that could be acceptable to God and that could reconcile man to him had to be made by God without something that, with something that was perfect, his own son. For this reason, Jesus Christ came into the world in human flesh to be the perfect sacrifice for sin, singular, and make atonement or propitiation for the, all the sins of all the people, Hebrews 2.17. The word propitiation is used in several key verses to explain what Jesus accomplished through his death on the cross. For example, in Romans 3, 24 and 25, we see that in Christ all shall be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. These verses are a key point in Paul's argument in the book of Romans and are really at the heart of the gospel message. 
In the first three chapters of Romans, Paul has made the argument that everybody, both Jew and Gentile alike, were under the condemnation of God and deserving of his wrath in Romans 1.18. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. All humans deserve his punishment. Nevertheless, God in his infinite grace and mercy has provided a way that his punishment is appeased and that man can be reconciled to him. That way is through the sacrificial death of his son, Jesus Christ, as the atonement or payment for sin. It is in Christ Jesus as God's perfect sacrifice foretold in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New Testament that man in faith is reconciled to God and all men have been given a measure of faith. It is only because of Christ's perfect life his death on the cross, and his resurrection that the lost are being reconciled to God. The wonderful truth of the gospel message is that humanity is being saved from God's wrath and reconciled to God not because we love God first, but that he first loved us humans and sent his Son to be the propitiation for the sins of mankind. 1 John 4.10 Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. The only way for God's wrath against sinful man, the only way for God's wrath against sinful man is appeased and man is reconciled to God is through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, there is no other way. This truth is also communicated in 1 John 2, 2. Quote, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, the planet hasn't committed a sin, but the word world there is referring to the cosmos of man, the corporate body of humanity. Okay, an important point of Christ's saving work includes deliverance from God's wrath. Jesus' atonement on the cross is the only thing that has turned away God's divine wrath. Therefore, our true well messaging to all men should be that we testify, quote, that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the cosmos. First John four fourteen. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach glad tidings of great joy, who bring an evangel of good news to all men, Romans ten fifteen. How beautiful are your feet. Jesus is the Savior of the world, quote. His mission is the restitution of all, quote created by God. How wonderful it, is, it will be for us to all see that day of, quote, the times of restitution of all things in brackets, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the fallen Adamic world began. Acts 3.21. Fallen Adamic in print, uh, brackets. <clears throat> That's the cosmos of Adam beginning. Uh, the mention of the since the war began suggests that God must have given Adam the same promise that he gave to Abraham, apparently, at some point after the first age began, and after the original parents transgressed, God spoke this promise of the restitution of all through the prophets that matched what he later gave to Abraham. It must have promised the same sheltering ransom gift Exodus 30.12, for all souls, the whole house of Israel, and must have pointed to Christ as that fulfillment of the promise whom would be the finisher and final shelter. This restitution of all, Paul says, is for the purpose of him having preeminence in all things. Colossians 1.18, he is to fill all things, Ephesians 4.10, by making all created things new, Revelations 21.5, and having all men, all flesh, come to believe and be reconciled, John 1.7, 1 Timothy 2.4, and Luke 3.6, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This occurs so that the entire human race may truly see what this fellowship of the mystery is, Ephesians 3.9. He explains his making a new heavens and a new earth for all men to dwell in, 2 Peter 3.13, where dwelleth only righteousness, 2 Peter 3.13, for the sole purpose of the glorification of him in all things, 1 Peter 4.11. We might paraphrase the above ideas as follows, and then we'll cut this off and move on to section to, uh, 3, 4, quote, 
but to paraphrase, after the first eon began, and after the transgression of man, God spoke by the mouths of all his holy prophets a wonderful promise for the future of the restitution of all created things by making all things new again, such as a new heavens and a new earth so as to accommodate all reconciled humanity. This is for the purpose of God having preeminence in all, and to be glorified by all living things in all that he has created, so that he may be fill, that he may fill all things, and be the all in all. Everything was made for his pleasure, and it will inevitably be so according to his will, as he says. And in this new heavens and new earth, where dwelleth only righteousness. No more shall there be any unrighteousness, hellish things, hell, punishments, or hell bound. All hellish things are made new. Well, t let's take a break, and we'll continue in the next uh, section. Uh, I believe that's section uh, four, with... God will save all. First Timothy two, one through six.